Yes, you lovely people. If you're not already, make sure you give us a follow over on Spotify. Yeah. I would love him to be here right now because I want to want to know he would put his grandmother in the back of the net. <laughs> <laughs> he just sees the ball. He's horrible. He's horrible he? to mark. Yeah. <laughs> He's impossible to mark. Impossible. Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of the Fozcast. We've got another banger for you today. And when I say banger, I mean that because it is a goalkeeping podcast. We are joined today by one of my former goalkeeper coaches. He's been goalkeeper coach for Southampton, for Norwich, for Birmingham City, and more importantly, the England men's senior team. We're joined by Dave Watson. Watto, how are you, mate? I'm very good, mate. Welcome. I'm delighted to be here to see you today. We're more delighted because I absolutely love you. I, I do. I buzz off you so much. You were my goalkeeper coach at Birmingham for a year and then at England, all right? And I've got to say, I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass here, what, honestly, right? But I think you are in my top two goalkeeper coaches of all time. Well, that's that's a, a remarkable compliment to say we've only just started. High praise. I'll get it out there early doors as well, though, that Watto is the most angry man I have, especially goalkeeper coach anyway, one of the angriest men I've ever met in my really? life. It's, but only because his standards are so high, aren't they? They are. Well, I wanted you to be the best you could be. <laughs> I never thought we'd be in this situation after we potentially both finished playing our football. Nah. So amazing. Uh, yeah, I um, always demanded some real high standards. And I think um, if you never had the bar raised up to there, then you'd have never got to the uh, potential that, that uh, I wanted you to get to. I'm good point, you. that. Really good point. I'm We've never you. had anyone say anything like that about, you know, where the bar is set. So yeah, that's that's it's true. If you're if you're working in an environment where that's just the minimum, just the minimum is doing it properly and working hard and making sure, like in goalkeeper terms, just making sure the ball doesn't go in the back of the net. You've done everything you can. Then every day you go into training. Well, not every day because some days I didn't even train. I'd like at Birmingham at that time. It was when I was I just signed from. I had a few knee problems and stuff like that. So there were times in uh, Birmingham, especially where I wouldn't train till like Thursday or Friday, wasn't no, it? No, but I think for me as a coach, that was one of the biggest learning curves as well because I think the main thing uh, for a goalie coach it's your relationship you build especially with the number one at that time and for me it would really been always pushing the number one to be as good as he could be and as prepared as he could be every match day for me not the, have the opportunity to train until a Wednesday a Thursday a Friday and having to see a different picture to make sure you were as prepared as you could be Open my eyes to another way as well yeah. and change the dynamic in a relationship. So I taught and a you trust. something as you well. You taught yeah. me something, there yeah, you for go, sure. See? It's for not sure. the first time we've heard that. But before we dive in and go all things GK and I'll, you two just geek out and I'll step back on it, we've got a question for you. Okay. Okay, so the question is. So you're Barnsley boy, aren't Barnsley you? Barnsley boy, yeah. Right, okay. So you wander down into, I don't know, Sheffield or somewhere and you walk... Uh, only occasionally. O only occasionally. <laughs> so you wander down into Sheffield, you walk into the wrong boozer and someone, and the Sheffield massive go, oh, Watto, get out. We're not having it. It gets a bit fruity and you get to pick three footballers that are going to stick up for you. You could, have, it, you could have coached them, you could have played with yeah, them, you, you could just present. be friends with them. Yeah? The three handy footballers you think, do you know what, I stand half a chance with these boys in front of me. It's a very good question. If I wandered into Sheffield, I might need more than three. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but my three, first one um, is a guy I'd I only ever worked with with the national team. He was the captain of the national team, Wayne Rooney. That's a good shout. It's a good shout. That is a good shout. Real tough upbringing. Mental, mentally, one of the strongest guys I've ever worked with. He loved his boxing. Yeah, he did. But there's one thing for sure, he wouldn't hang back in a scrap. Yeah. yeah. So I'd have him up there in my three for sure. That's and that. I would feel pretty comfortable that them Sheffield lads might get a good kick in. I'd, I'd say at this moment in time, he's probably only got about five or six like big haymakers left in him like before he's blowing, blowing a gasket or two. Yeah, but, I think. Mate, in his head, one, he's a sicko, one, isn't he? He's not giving in, is he? No, he's not. He's not, not giving in. He's not. They're going to have to put him down and then I'll step in, just Barnsley lad, finish him off. That's you know a good I mean? start. Right, a that's a good start, start yeah? Yeah, very good, good start. Right. S second, a lad I used to play with at Barnsley. A lad from Manchester, his name is Darren Sheridan. Yeah. His brother's John okay. Sheridan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Now, this kid is a street fighter, right? <laughs> so th there's two things that will happen if we're in a fight in Sheffield. One, he's going to talk his way out in it for a long time, like Manx do, yeah? <laughs> yeah. But if it comes to it... Oh. He, yeah, the windmills are out and he's not giving in until somebody carries him out. So he'd be in there for sure. Okay. He's sure in there. Big Darren Sheridan. Number Darren two. Sheridan. Big and Darren Wazza. Sheridan. He'd love that show. He's five foot four. Anyway, no problem. And third off, and this one, um, I've got my son to thank for this one a little bit, I think, because I bought his book for him to read last summer. And he's actually a Sheffield lad. And I never, ever thought he were a real scrapper till I read his book. But I saw his eyes when I worked with him. Jamie Vardy. Oh. So, he'd be, so he'd be able to talk to him, because he's a Sheffield lad, just to appease it a little bit. But I think he's a killer in yeah. his hometown. Yeah. Oh. We, we talked about it on the podcast recently, and we, Ben said, fire a few Red Bulls down. I mean, he's good to go, isn't he? I think for sure. So if we've had a proper night out, like lads from Barnsley normally do, and he's still there at the end, I think we're in business. Chat shit, get banged. I'm all over it, man. I, I agree with you. Jamie Vardy, he, 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 he would be exactly what he is on the pitch as well. He ain't, pull, he ain't pulling out of everything. He's a killer. He's a sniffer. He can sense it. He can sense it. It's common. But I was just thinking, Sheffield lad, if it's really tasty, he can talk him down a bit and then just kill. I like that. You've given some thoughts that one. That's a big three, that. I don't fancy coming up against any of them three, to be perfectly honest with you. No, I don't. And, and I always need bodyguards in Sheffield. For so sure, perfectly. mate, for sure. <laughs> right, we got, we, I want to I keep it a little bit relevant. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about England. You've been an England goalkeeper coach yourself four years as the first team goalkeeper coach. Um, I want to talk about the current setup, the current crop of England goalkeepers, all right? In your eyes, at this moment in time, Jordan Pickford's obviously England's number one, but... How do you see it? How do you see the picture? I always think um, whoever's in the driving seat in club football, international football, you're in the driving seat. Yeah. So he's the number one and he's earned the right to be that number one. The great thing with England at the minute is there's a lot of challenges. Yeah, there is. So if he's not on top of his game, X, Y or Z are ready to pounce. Yeah. And I think that is really beneficial. When I did the job for four years, I thought at that time we had a real crop that really challenged each other. We had three, four young uh, goalkeepers at that time. The training was incredible and you had to perform. Yeah. And I think England now have got back to that real strength. A, number one, but B, in depth. And the challenge is there. It's his place to lose. So when you're in the driving seat, you can see that as a pressure. But actually, when you're up there, you're always the one to be shot at. So he's in the driving seat and it would be really difficult for him unless he has a real catastrophic drop of form for both club or country that he wouldn't probably, in my opinion, start. So what happens if at the start of the next Prem season, for example, because he, he was a bit up and down last season by all accounts. Um, what, uh, to be fair, at the end of the season, yes. Jordan Pickford was yeah, the man, yeah. by the way. Yeah, he kept, was he the kept, man. He kept him in the league. He yeah. literally yeah, kept yeah. him in the league at like, end of last season, the, the, didn't some he? Some of them saves. Incredible. Them. Wow. Incredible. But let's say you get into September, October and his form's patchy, let's say. Does that influence, because this is a big debate actually, and people, like, does that influence the England? Because if he's always been solid for England, and I'm one of these, I'll go, he's been brilliant for England. He's always been brilliant. Never let England down. But if his club form is patchy, does that influence the England decision? I think um, club form is always going to be seen because everybody sees it. But England's a different game. Ben will tell you that. You get in that environment, it's a different game. And ultimately, the players that turn up to represent the country have to know and believe that when they turn in, up into that environment, there's a trust in that environment with the management, the coaches that maybe have not seen you for two or three months mm. or whatever. So, yes, the pressure comes from the club, but when you come into your country and you then turn up at St George's Park and you've got your week's training before your first camp, you know, you feel safe if the environment's there. The manager wants you to be there. That's why you've been selected. The coach wants you to be there. You're still at the top of your tree and hopefully coming away from club football into a different environment, settling back into friends you've not seen or worked with, 
and the trust in that environment and you feel comfortable. Yes, the pressure will be there for the coaches and the managers to keep selecting you, but that environment normally fetches something different out in you. How, how, how often does a manager like pull you aside and go, what, what, what are you saying about the goalkeepers at this minute? And so I say you've been on a camp for three or four days as a game in two or three days time. How often will he pull you and go, Dave, talk to me about the goalies. Who's looking good? Who's looking fresh? Like mentally, is everybody there on the same page? What, how's it looking? Yeah, it's a real good question. When I did the job, we would always speak once every week, once every two weeks. So it was Roy Hodgson and Ray Lewington, Ray, obviously yes. when you were England. Is this away from camp? Yeah, away, during away the from season. camp, yeah. So we're always getting the reports and the scouting reports. Obviously, I'm still working in the Premier League and doing the job as well. Uh, so you were I, working at Norwich, uh, Norwich, and Norwich at the time, time wasn't you? Yeah. 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 So I'm seeing the lads playing anyway. I have two or three scouts that send me a report every week and then we'll, we'll speak about how, who's doing what, who's not doing what who the upcoming... So, so it's, a, it's a conversation once every week or two, but certainly when you're becoming closer to picking a squad, then you really want to know who the two or three guys are that you're really putting your money on, who you're thinking about putting in the standby squad, and then you talk about where they're at in, in every aspect of it. And that would then be my job, obviously, probably the week before to phone whoever's in the squad and say, look, you're fit, you're well, you're ready to go. But normally, we'd had all our discussions, so when the guys turned up, I would know, A, obviously the programme for the week, in terms of my sessions were already planned and penned in, but if it were a, a, a camp where we'd got two friendlies, or a qualifier and then a friendly, we'd know in his mind who were doing what before we started, and then it's to make sure when I get in to camp and we start training, that I tell the lads what's happening, but make sure that they're ready to do what's required in that environment when, when, so say <clears throat> so Qatar World Cup's coming up right in the build up to that Qatar World Cup in the weeks leading up to it okay do does the manager does the goalie coach know the have a vague idea of what the pecking order is going to be where, of who's going to be first choice who's going to be second choice who's going to be third on my understanding of how it should work or how it certainly worked when I were there, we would we would know yeah, you'd have that, that pecking order. And then and you would have already mapped out the game time yeah. for the three goalies leading up to that tournament. In the friendlies and stuff. In the friendlies. Yeah, okay. And then when you're away at a tournament, is it how important is having that pecking order so that everybody knows their job? So they've got first choice goalie knows he has to get ready for games, second choice knows he has to be ready, but also get the first choice. Third is to make sure everything is cool around the edges. I thought when we worked together and we went to the World Cup, I thought it was pretty clear the pecking order. Yeah. I think everybody understood the pecking order, but it's also then about the three guys who are there creating the environment for the coach and the rest of the players, but certainly in the small goalkeeping environment to make sure that you're all there working, challenging, supporting, but there's no knocking on the doors. I want to be doing this, I want to be doing that. And I think when we had that environment, there were no animosity. I, I'd probably never worked in an environment like it. You, you, you know, you trained unbelievably well together. Yeah. I thought you got real respect for each other, but then away from the field, you spent time together, I never had to force you to get in the gym to do extras and bits and pieces. I used to come you in had occasion. to stop us going in the gym, honestly. Yeah, like... no, for sure. But that <laughs> is an environment that you can't buy. Yeah, it's true. You guys created that. Yeah. Made my job so much easier. Obviously, I didn't want to come in the gym and join in too much because it was hard work. But, <laughs> but the environment you created made my, my job were easy. That's probably the easiest I've ever had it as a coach. And, really. that's, and that's because before, I, I'm guessing like the point you've already made, before you went away, you knew. Yeah, well, the Joe knew. knew. Yeah, it, it was, so everyone's gone to the tournament going, this is my role. Now, and a question on the third goalkeeper, would it ever influence the manager, goalkeeping coach? to kind of, you got number one, they're there. Number two, could quite realistically come into the team, injury, sent off, et cetera, et cetera. For that number three goalkeeper, is there an element of how good they are around the lads? So if you've got two, two goalkeepers vying for number three, would you kind of go, he'd be better for the lads than them and they might be technically have the edge? I think, I think there's a lot to talk about for the third choice. The, the, the point you make is to be really good in the group of goalies and not be disruptive and give your all and really support the two guys who are in front of you is key. You have to be good around the place. 
especially when there's been a game and you might have to go and do an hour's worth of shooting the next day yeah. with the lads who have not played. So the environment is key for everything. But if you're talking now about a manager or a coach and development, you've got two things. You bring a young one in who, who you think is now going to be challenging in one, two, four years' time, there's a pathway. Or you bring a really experienced one in who ticks all them boxes that you're saying. Right. So you can go two, you can go really young or really old to cover all bases, or you go like we did really in uh, Brazil. We want three good goalies. They understood the order of it, but they were all ready to play if required. Yeah, let me put, just put a bit of context around the goalies, by the way. The, the Brazil World Cup that we went to, um, it was uh, it was Joe Hart, number first choice goalkeeper, me, second choice goalkeeper, and Fraser Forster as third choice goalkeeper. Um, and I've got to say, mate, we had, don't get me wrong, the tournament didn't go so well for us. We got knocked out early doors in the group stages. But as a as a working unit, what oh, it was, honestly, it was absolutely world class. The goalkeeping department, we, the, we were basically left to do what we Wanted, what we wanted to do what we needed to do because the manager had full trust in not only Dave but obviously the goalkeepers underneath him as well and then we just buzzed off the training because Dave as a goalie coach is top class like top top class mate no, you are but, but it's easy when you've got you know what we talked about it, you, you can't buy the environment if there's any disruptive figure it's difficult yeah because the environment becomes difficult when you've got three lads who buzz off each other and you're trying to improve somewhere, somehow, every day. You all wanted to beat whoever were in the goals. Yeah, it weren't, you know, easy. But this, but we didn't, the we, didn't, the we didn't hide it, did we? Never we didn't hide, hide no, the no. fact that if we were shooting, if so, so, Joe was in goal, right? Unless it was a Friday where I'm trying to make yeah. him feel good before the game. Oh, so you'd do that? Yeah. So on a Friday, you don't want to go sticking them in the top corner, bottom corner, every goal, posting in. You don't want to be doing that to the goalkeeper, do you? But I, you want to make him feel like making set, just make saves. Feel make ready. Saves. I always feel, and and I actually feel a little bit old as a goalie coach now because. That's my feel. I played the game yeah. and I've coached now for 25 years. And I always feel as though the basics of goalkeeping, you want to go into that game, whether it's a Tuesday night, Wednesday night or a Saturday, the day before the game, you want, don't want to be bending your back, picking the ball out of the net mm. five, six times every set or whatever. It's just, it's just really going back to basics getting a real confidence and feeling ready. And I'm a bit like that with the warm-ups on the match day. Yeah, yeah. I think some days now it's all gone crazy and all varying tools to get you to a point. But the basics of keeping goal have not really changed. The The way we have to play now with your feet's different, but the mentality about the keeping the ball out of the back of the net and you feeling comfortable to get on that pitch and ready for that match, to me, hasn't changed. And even going back to my time, which is a long time ago, I hated picking that ball out of the net, whether it's training or a match day. And you just need to feel comfortable that you're ready and prepared to play. I think, I think that's the big thing with goalkeeping that people don't understand. I think it's inbuilt in you. If you're a professional goalkeeper, even if you're not, even you could be semi-pro, you could be amateur, it doesn't matter. If you're a goalkeeper, the, the overriding feeling is you just want to stop the ball going in the back of the net. Yeah, you do. You want yeah. to do. But I'd say, even saying that though, I've seen some young kids come in sometimes, right? And they just, you can see they haven't got this will to stop the ball going in the back of the net. They might make a mistake and it might dribble through their legs. And instead of turning around quickly to try and stop it and scoop it off the line and stuff like that, yeah? They just watch it go in and I'm thinking and it makes my blood boil right I'm going stop the ball going in. what the f what are you but some people just haven't got it in them yeah but the majority of people actually do have that and if you're a goal, proper goalkeeper you'll have that inbuilt in you anyway so the Friday is quite literally get your hands on the ball just yeah. get it get it get it make yourself feel good a few little dives a few little this and that because tomorrow yeah same thing you need to be mentally right because for me men the mental side of goalkeeping is the most important part of goalkeeping. Most goalkeepers, this is a question for you then, Dave, right? I would say most goalkeepers in the Premier League nowadays, yeah, most goalkeepers are about the same ability wise. They're about the same. You've got obviously ones who are proper, 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 and you've got ones that, but I'd say ability wise, they're about the same. But for me, the difference is what's in between their, their ears. That's the biggest bit. W would agree. If you could take this podcast away and go and get all 20 goalies, and I put a session on for yeah. that 20 goalies and you filmed it, say an hour, hour and a half, very little to choose. Yeah. And you could actually be really surprised by what you'd see. Yeah. 
But the reality is, why there's a goalie playing for the team who ends up 20th, and why there's a goalie playing for the team who finishes first, and why there's a goalie who goes and plays international football, is here. Yeah. Always. They can all make unbelievable saves. They have all got an unbelievable passing range and can play with the feet. That is the modern goalie. But to turn out week in, week out for that top four team and then go away when everybody else is going on their holidays and go and play for England, Belgium, Spain, whoever you want to, it is a different mentality. And you have to have something different. Mm. So to play in the Premier League compared to the Championship, you've got something different. Yeah. To play in the Premier League in the top six or eight, you've got something different. To be the champions or fighting to be champions, you've got something different. And if you go on to play international football, these are guys that are wired different. <laughs> that one to 20 <laughs> session, you would not see too much. Yeah, I agree. But yeah. they are wired different. Yeah, there's times when I've gone away and I've trained with other guys, I've trained with England and you see other kids coming in and joining in. You might go and watch another goalkeeping session. We might be playing against Spain and you might go to the stadium where that Spain are already training. Yeah, you, get training see, yeah, yeah. you get to see the, go the goalies for Spain training and you watch the session and you think, yeah, he, he looks all right, but you know he's he's nothing special. He's nothing special yeah. on a match day, pff, mate. He is wired in, he wow. is tuned in, and he is like a cat, but, isn't he? It's a joke. How can you prepare? So if you take it right back to the start, so you've got um, some new seven, eight, nine, ten. You've got to feed them all the bits, and you don't know until it comes. The mentality mm. to play in front of. 2,000, 4,000, 50,000, 100,000, 100 million on Sky, yeah. World Cups, billions. These are all the things that come in your mind and the best just handle it. It's, it's another it's day like, the It's office. bottle, isn't it? Like that, that's, I know it's a, yeah. such a simple kind of phrase, yeah. but having an element of bottle about it. When you get your scouting reports, say when you were with England and you're getting these weekly scouting reports, how much emphasis is placed on mentality, i.e. will there be a line in the report saying, he's temperamental or he's got a bad attitude or is, is there an element of that? Not not in terms of the, the terminologies you're using, but the, the biggest thing for a goalkeeper is you are going to make a mistake every game. Mistakes, potentially, especially in the modern game, especially with passing and the range of passing, you, you become more exposed. Taking a cross, shot stopping, maybe not so much, but you can still make, in a decision-making process, yeah. a real big mistake. So the biggest thing I had, when that mistake comes, it's the next reaction, it's the next action. Because when you're playing goal, you're gonna make them. Yeah. But the next action, the next ball is what's key, and that's what you're talking about with the training. Yeah. If that ball goes in, you want a desire to stop it going in, but the next action is now key. And if that's still in you, you're going to make mistake after mistake. You're not going to perform in training. But in goal, some of the best moments I've seen th from goalies I've worked with is w wonderful saves and all the things. That's nice. But after a mistake, the coach feels it because you've got the relationship with a goalie. You really feel it. But when that next moment comes and that's positive, and hopefully then your team dig you out and you go on and win the game, but you've made saves, good decisions after it, that tells you you're going on that. That's your true marker of, true of what marker. he's built, what he's got. What he's got. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, who who have you worked with? Which which goalkeeper would you say mentally the the strongest mental goalkeeper you've met or you've worked with? I would have said um, probably Joe. Yeah. At the time when he when he were at his peak. Yeah. Um, saves training unbelievable. How good was Joe in training, by the way? My first time jo joining England, obviously it's a real big thing for me. I, I mean, you're in awe, you, you're working with people that y you've only really seen on opposition benches when I'm working in the in the Premier League and, and then you get to work and know these people. But I, it really sticks clear with me. At the end of the, 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 the first session, he just said, right lads, and they did a shooting session. It were at the Etihad Stadium and I just, really kept fetching the balls because they, they honestly for half an hour they couldn't beat him and I thought wowee but he'd got the mentality it was a challenge between him and them a competition, a competition. It's all, it was a constant it competition always a competition wasn't it? but they could not beat him and he had the, he, he had at the time of being at the power at the peak of his powers he had something 
that I, you know, I can't quantify it anymore, but he had something. Yeah. But then when the adversity comes, he was still really strong. And obviously I've got a close relationship with him too. And I'm just so pleased that through all the adversity, because a guy who wins the Premier League for Man City and goes on to win 70 odd caps for England, and then he's come back and won the league in Scotland and to still want to do it and still want to do it and perform in front of 50, 60,000 when you can just slope off into the background gives you some insight into yep. the mentality the guy's got and you have to come through can the I, tough I, times. Can I just jump on the back of that with the Joe Hart thing, right? Uh, I know I know exactly what you're saying. His energy, right? His, it, like I say, it, it, especially in his pomp, because I saw him in his pomp. We, that, when we were in that England squad together for a few years, whatever it was, the energy that he bought, right? Whether, whether it was training, whether it was... To the group were massive. To, to the group was incredible. In the changing room was incredible, yeah? When he started speaking, lads would shut up and listen to him, wouldn't they? They would watch him and listen to him. Like, he was a leader, like you wouldn't believe. But then the same thing out on the pitch, like pure energy, pure enthusiasm. We could finish a training session and everybody's knackered. I was definitely knackered, right? Because <laughs> I was the oldest one there anyway. Um, but... They, the lads want to do shooting and he wants to do the shooting right. he's asking to do the shooting yeah and I'm thinking nobody asked for shooting please and he's saying lads anybody want to do some shooting I'm thinking he was, piss off Joe he had the mentor he, he wanted to prove that he was unbeatable yeah and that's something that's just instilled in instilled. you instilled it's great it, isn't it yeah it's great but you can't you can't tell that to a young lad today if we were going out after this chat and we're going to put a session on for the eight year olds yeah. we're just trying to work on them technically love goalkeeping keep the ball out of the net but the mentality has to grow as you get older can I can I talk about um, a, a young goalkeeper coming through at Birmingham when I signed for Birmingham there was a there was a young kid coming through 18 years at the time Dave Watson's the goalie coach at, coach at Birmingham City and a young lad called Jack Butland um, was coming up through the ranks yeah um I remember signing for Birmingham and I saw this kid, 18 years old. He's about an inch taller than me already. He was built like a man already, honestly, built like you wouldn't believe. Um, mentally, the way he, he spoke to people, he would shake your hand, he'd look in your eyes. I was like, wow, you are going to be something, mate. Talk to me about Jack Butland when he was a kid. Yeah, I mean, a real inspirational guy when you see him now really matured and gone on to be successful probably not as successful as he would have liked at the moment if truth be told but he had a real different upbringing through his time he, ne he never joined Birmingham full-time as an apprentice really clever intellectually finished his schooling used to come up one day a week two days a week do the training but then when he joined and we started the pathway, I think it really helped in terms of he had Joe one year to train with, he had you the second year, Mike Taylor yeah, were always yeah. there in the background as the senior guy, um, you know, cajoling him along and that. But really from an unconventional start in goalkeeping to have got to the level he got to is really incredible. But he changed his mentality in that period to become a killer if you like yeah. and to really focus in on what were important because he'd got the raw materials really raw materials like Ben started yeah. later really yeah. raw materials but then the intellect to know that you have to change mentally if you're going to be doing the job and playing in goal and taking it to the next level but but he only trained once or twice a week for, for the first couple of years in his and in how his, old was he at that point? He, he would have come in at 17, really. Wow. 16, 17, 17. I remember at the time, because <laughs> I mean, Ben have been friends forever, and very rarely, very, if ever, have you ever come home and voluntarily gone, oh, this player, I, I will always dig and go, what's he like? Is he a good player? Any good kids coming through? And I remember voluntarily him saying, there's a lad at Birmingham, he's a beast. And this was like 18 yeah. year old, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, it was. Math. It, was it was incredible. I, honestly, he was just so tall. We used to do this thing in the gym, right? The ceiling wasn't, wasn't quite, wasn't very tall in the gym, um, but it was tall enough that he could squat down and jump and headbutt the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> it was a joke, right? This kid was like, he was like Tigger, like Winnie the Pooh. It was a joke, right? And I remember watching him thinking, how the heck have you just jumped up and headbutted the ceiling? Like, you, you, you can't, you're barely jumping up and touching it with your hand. He could do that. I was watching thinking, wow, mate. Like, I reckon you got a chance here. But again, that's the physicality and yeah. that's the benefit of all the programs and th the way things off the field, what you're given. 
because he had the raw materials on the field. But again, he had the mentality to know that if he did the things right off the field, he could become a monster yeah. in goal, a monster. And ultimately, that's that's what he become. And hopefully now he can get on an, uh, another pathway and start and I want I want to talk about training, Dave, okay? So you, you, you've put a training session on, okay? You've got your goalies working. What? How? How minute is the detail you work to? Do you see literally everything that happens in a training session? Yeah, no matter what it is with a goalkeeper, it could be his hand position, head position, eyes, where he is, is he set too wide apart, his legs. Do you see quite literally everything? And we'll try and pick it up there and then. I think that's the art of the coaching. Yeah. What I would say is I've got older, and when certainly my power diminished physically and I've got the goalies doing more of the serving yeah. and you can then observe in the element of the practice you can see more but experience tells me even when I'm doing the serving I know where you should be and I know what to expect when I, when a ball does X, Y or Z yeah. and it is there and experience like playing in goal the older you get you lose your power you lose the spring what we were just talking about with Jack but you're never in a poor position when you've played a lot of times in goal. Yeah. You've been there a million times. And it's like me as a coach, I've done that session or seen that action a million times. So you know what to expect at their moments. And really, the higher level you go, it's the fine tuning of their moments. So it's like a balance, isn't it then, I guess, as a younger goalkeeper, you might have all of the physical attributes, the spring and everything else, but maybe the experience of the positioning isn't quite there, which I guess... Yeah, it won't be there. It no, won't be there, which, honestly. Which it won't, I, will it? I They're miles it off it sometimes, to, honestly. Yeah, yeah. But then I guess it goes back to the the really rare breeds that you see in goal that might be 24 years old, 25, playing for like a Real Madrid yeah. or someone that I guess it's that unicorn where they've got both. They've got the physical attributes, they're young and they've got that well, experience you'll have, you'll have people like so G, um, Gigi Donnarumma how, how old is he at the minute 21, 22 22 is he 23 uh, he's, 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 very he, he's, he's had like the most <laughs> his, his career has just gone like that right he, he's very he's very rarely had a huge setback or a huge mistake where it's You've, he's had chance to actually go, right, what's he made of now then, okay? And I, I guarantee you, within a few, within the next year, two years, whatever, something will probably happen to him. I'm Big. not saying it will, but something will probably happen to him where it will genuinely go, oh, I've never felt this before. I've yeah. never had this much of a setback. And you see it with these younger goalkeepers, you do. It's like they're just living off adrenaline. They're doing an autopilot. And then all of a sudden something will happen where it makes them take a step back and then, then their brain starts working. And you just think, oh no, don't, don't use your brain, mate. <laughs> but don't that, don't that, use your brain. That's danger time. Because yeah. everything's been so natural to them. So they could have the best coach in the world, the worst coach in the world. That, that doesn't matter. They've got to that point. And it's just been natural. They've played... They've, they've done all the bits, but the first point, it's not going so well, whether it's one game, two games, probably a half a dozen games, and then they start thinking, and position. Position for this ball on this angle, this cross. When you start thinking as a goalie, you're finished. Yeah, you it even has to be half natural. a step. You could be thinking millimeters. May, may, yeah, literally. I could. I, maybe I should be a few millimeters more left, or let, maybe my hand should have been higher. Like it was obviously wasn't going to kick it on the floor. He, he's obviously he's going to kick it high, and then these, you start second guessing yourself. These are things obviously you have to work on. So, am, am I right in saying is what you are saying? is that that's what you're doing on the Monday to, to Wednesday, Monday to Thursday. You're working on these things and in the week, making it part of your, your muscle memory, your routine. So then on the Saturday, that Saturday is when you don't think. Because you've talked so many times on this podcast about once I cross the white line, it's autopilot. That's but is it wasn't it, when I was younger. That's the, that's the thing. It wasn't when I was younger. When I got older, I'd say from, from Bur joining Birmingham onwards, it became autopilot for me. And what is that just experience? I'd say so. I'd say it's playing the games. It's getting, like I always think, getting out on loan for anybody is probably the most important building process of so anybody's will, football career. Will Donnarumma be a better goalkeeper when he's 30 than what he is now? You don't know. You just, it's hard to say because people's bodies grow differently. He might be, he, he, physically, he might be in his pomp now. You know what I mean? He might slow down. He might get this and whatever. You just don't know. Because he's a big lad, to be fair. He's an absolutely massive lad. And as, as massive lads get older, yeah. that, and, uh, it, it's natural for them to slow down quite rapidly. So you just don't know. But I think the most important part for him is what's in between his head. 
is Ian, sorry. That is the most important part for sure. Wow. Just be before we go any further, just want to kind of put, because obviously, Dave, you've had a brilliant goalkeeping career and I'm sure you'll do a, a lot more. But rewind back in the day, how you got into it. Obviously, you were a player with Barnsley, um, over 200 games uh, and whatnot. So how did you talk us through for some of the younger viewers how you got into becoming a goalkeeper? Because it was um, it was kind of forced by injury, no? Into the coaching? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, the coaching, I'd played, like you said, a couple of hundred games. I was fortunate enough to uh, have a year in the Premier League. Um, and the season after, um, started the season, obviously the team wanted to try and get back up. I'd just signed a new contract, so fortunate from that perspective. Um, got injured in a, in a game against uh, Norwich. What did you do? Can you remember? It was the time when they played um, little dinked corners into the near post. Yeah. So they've played the little dinked one into the near post and they, fl they, f they flicked it on. So I'm, I'm in, a, in a position at the near post and as the flicks come, he's obviously flicked it towards the back. So I'm shuffling and twist on my right knee Ooh. and there's a contact at the back. So I make a save, but as I've twisted, I've felt this is not, and it, but it's just before half time. And like really, you know, I didn't feel like a catastrophic, this Just is a twinge of, oh, that's yeah, weird. This, yeah. So coming at half time and like it's seizing up now as I'm sat in the thing. So I had a couple of injections, no sub goalie or whatever, and played the second half and I just couldn't move. Now, if you'd have told me from that point, I would never play a professional game again. Wow. In the first team, that would have been mental. So from that point, I thought I'd just done a little bit of cartilage or something because I'd had a cartilage problem 18 months to two years before and that got dealt with so obviously go for a little bit of surgery and really if I'm honest that's what I thought at this time little bit of cartilage problem and the mention that I'd got some bone on bone stuff but but I'm naive I'm 23 I think 22 23 Were you that young when you did it yeah and and you don't realize what they're telling you so I rehabbed really like I'd had the cartilage problem I played a reserve game at Halifax Town on the Wednesday, and we were playing, I remember Grimsby on the Saturday, I can't remember, we were all more away. The manager had been to the reserve game at Halifax on the Wednesday afternoon. Um, I'm sat in the dressing room after the game, and I could not move, honestly, you know the big ice pack. Massive, packs, oh. Massive ice pack, knees up there, and he said, uh, well done today, Dave, you'll be in Saturday. That's a gaffer, <laughs> I'm not being on Saturday. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, I said, I think I've got some serious problems. You then go and get another opinion and then everything starts to unwind. And basically I'd got holes in my two bone surfaces and... Microfracture. It, microfracture. Yeah. I had a microfracture, did nothing for six months. Then they had a bit where they take my shin, took a piece of good cartilage, oh. grew it in an incubator, yeah. put it back in. The microfracture is a bit where they have to drill to loads, loads of little, of little holes. holes yeah. So they go in and they drill loads of little holes around Just the area. Just to try and get some growth. To encourage bone and, growth, basically. So, so yeah. your bones are not, there's some okay. kind of cushioning. Yeah, it will bleed um, and then hopefully bone growth will promote around. So I tried of. all these things. Eventually I tried the cartilage in the incubator and six months later put it back in. Um, and really unfortunately, when I went and had the cartilage put back in, and uh, everything, I never felt like it had gone really well. I rehabbed, but as soon as I started to really push it, I felt as though the, I could feel it grinding. Really? So I went back to the surgeon, I said, look, we, we, I want you to go in and give me a real honest opinion where I'm at here. So he went in, obviously told me it weren't very good, but from him doing the arthroscopy, I got an infection Oof. and I were in hospital for a month on a drip, I, oh. I was finished. But the infection was so bad that they had to take everything out. So, what do you mean, like what? Yeah, what? So, so all the, the gauze, the the uh, cartilage that had grown, oh, the cap, wow. it was so oh, infected. So they'd have to rip all, 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 all the work out. All the work out and that were that, that were it. Because this is the case of now, it's not a case of it's trying to save your leg or? Yeah, no, it got to that stage. I were in hospital for a month, I was really poorly, uh, but the infection, had become so bad, I were having a surgery every day, but I had to go in at the end of the day so that they could scrub the, the, the theater afterwards because the infection's obviously a risk 
to whoever's going in there next. So I spent a month in that situation, but by the time they'd cleared the infection, there were nothing really left to save, the knee. So you knew at that point, that's it, this is done now, yeah. That yeah. Were it, yeah. And you retired at 28, is that right? Uh, 26, 26. Really, yeah. Yeah. Blimey, because you, you'd played under 21s England, yeah. you'd had the year in the Prem yeah. with Barnsley. We were like kids at that yeah. stage, but that was like when we were like... I probably you got know, you in a Panini sticker. Yeah, I remember, I remember. I would have liked you to have brought that yeah. in to want me yeah. to have a look. Yeah, I remember because you were like really obviously blonde hair now. We'll find like a picture. Really if you're watching on YouTube, this is his Panini yeah. sticker up here, by the way. But that Barnsley Merlin. team... It's not Panini, it's Merlin. It's Merlin, yeah. It was Merlin, It was Merlin, yeah. I can't even remember. Yeah, it was Merlin. That Barnsley team were... They were, I remember like we were talking beforehand you had some names in that team didn't you I didn't realise Chris Morgan was in that team was yeah, it yeah for sure yeah. and then we were kind of having a walk down memory lane yesterday you had like Jan Agafjord off and there was one player I remember at the time because he was in do you remember when you used to do the Sun fantasy team yeah but it was a paper yeah, yeah and then you'd yeah, have yeah, to yeah. ring yeah. it through and yeah, yeah. Um, you transfers and there was one player how good was Neil Redburn Phenomenal player. <laughs> yeah. How we good was Neil Redburn? <laughs> For us to have had a player like that in that team, obviously he was the captain of our team, so he was the mainstay of our team, but he just led from the front. The way he played was the way he trained. Yeah. He came, every training session he came off, he, he looked like he was dying. He gave everything to every moment, yeah. but he lifted the level of our team and obviously he lifted the, the performance of the players He used to him. score some worldies as well, didn't Oh, he? for sure, yeah. What a sure. player he was. Yeah, Do you remember him? How good he was. Yeah, of course he was, yeah. Animal, yeah. absolute yeah. tank. So, Eric Tinkler. Eric Tinkler. Oh Ariane de Jou. God, yeah. Fleming. And that's old school. This is the proper old. Georgie Christoph. I guarantee you, our <laughs> listeners right now are going, who? Nah, who? there'll be some, <laughs> some older They'll boys They'll remember going. one or two of them. Yeah, yeah, one yeah. Two. Um, so, so how do you then go from that to go, right, I want to be a goalkeeper coach? And, and where does it start? Where does the road start from that point? I realised probably six months into the, the injury that I were in big trouble, Yeah, to be honest with you. Um, and at 23 or probably 24 at that time, you're thinking... I've got, I, I feel as though I've got something to give it. I, I want to fight for something. I wanted to be the best goalkeeper I could be. And that's, that's gone. I, I, that's impossible. I can't, I can't do that. So I felt as though I wanted to be the best goalie coach and try and produce something that I couldn't be. Yeah. And I think that's where I had the fight and the hunger. I wanted to make goalies be what I couldn't be. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's where the, the, the passion came the, the drive, the hunger. Were you, was that what you were like as a player then? Were your standards always high? Would you push yourself and work hard, all that kind of stuff? Uh, re really, really push and force myself, yeah. How did the transition work though? So at what point, because I, I can imagine that at 23, 24, 25 years old, you're in the doldrums here. At what point do you kind of go, okay, now it's on to the next phase of my life and I'm going to get into goalkeeping coaching. How did that transition work? Yeah, I mean, a, a coach that, that Ben would have worked with or certainly knows Eric Steele were my goalkeeping coach when I had to finish playing. And he were the one that helped me start to get on the courses, uh, give me advice in terms of getting on the courses, watching and learning from people, going to clubs to visit. And, watching sessions. Yeah, and yeah. really try and utilise my time to, to try and be ready for the next step. But the, the, the coaching pathway, it's a long pathway. You don't all of a sudden become qualified. It took me three or four years to do the goalkeeping badges, the outfield badges, to get to the point where so you're So to ready. be a goalie coach, you have to do outfield coaching badges as well? Yes. Yeah. Even now? Now, yeah. Oh, wow. But it makes you a better coach. Yeah. And I think, depending on the level you go in at, you can actually now really go to a club and help because if you work at the Premier League, there's a coach for this, there's a coach for that. But if you go where I started, Northampton Town, you have to help take the reserve team. You have to coach the- A bit of everything. Bit of everything. Yeah. So actually having the qualifications gives you the confidence to push on and do other bits and pieces. And that's what's enabled me to leave goalkeeping coaching, go on and be an uh, assistant coach, uh, do the set pieces that I've done for 10 or 15 years at teams. So when you're doing set pieces, are you the guy that gets up on a Friday or Saturday or Saturday morning or whatever and when they've got the team meeting and you're the guy that go, right, set pieces, lads, this is what we're going to do, yeah? Are you the guy that gets up that, and does that? That was me. That yeah, was that, me. Well, so, me. So obviously on a Friday, like normally what you do is on a Friday morning before training or after, or after training, you'd have a team meeting and it's all about the opposition tomorrow. It's literally about the opposition. This is what they do. This is how they play. They're going to do this, blah, 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 blah. This is their set pieces. This is where they're cornered. 
corners will go. This is where the free kicks will go. Throw-ins, this is what they do. And then it's lads, this is what we're going to do, okay? We're going to try and aim for the back post because they leave that space open or this, that, whatever. Dave is that guy. He's already planned all the set pieces. He's looked at the opposition set pieces, tried to figure a way out to thwart them so they don't benefit off it. And he's the guy that's entrusted to do that. It's a fairly big deal, isn't it? It's a big deal. And it doesn't matter what level you're working yeah. at. It's become a massive part of the game. And it's obviously a real time consuming thing and you know but you have to have the belief from the manager whoever that manager is who you're working with because he has to give you the platform to do your team meetings do your debriefs but more than all that you he has to give you the platform to work on the field that's really interesting i've got a question for you both here so i watched a a tv interview recently with john terry and they were talking oh he's one of the one of the greatest prem defenders as we all know and they asked him about the hardest players he played against and he said do you know what? Most players, he goes, I was cool with, he said, but the night before playing Thierry Henry, he said, I just always knew tomorrow's going to be a hard day. Tomorrow's going to be a really hard day. So as a coach, goalkeeping coach, and as a goalkeeper, what players, so it could be a Drogba, it could be a centre-half or whatnot, what players, if you can list off a few players, did you know or do you know we're going to have our hands full tomorrow with them? Go on, what? what? Well, playing in, in, the, in the league now, if, if you're coming up against um, Chelsea's front three, I know th th there's a lot of stigma about Lukaku, but we played him early season this year. So you've got Lukaku up top, you've got Werner and Havertz. Yeah. I mean, they're causing you lots of problems. Lots of problems. Physical strength, speed, energy running in behind, and just technical ability. I don't think a lot of people would expect you to say that. No, yeah. But that's the insight that we want, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, maybe. So I think people might just automatically expect you to go, Liverpool. Chelsea don't necessarily get that. But they, they, they I, I think if you talk about Liverpool's front three, you know that none of them are six foot four, and, but they're all quick, they're all technical, and the, the, you certainly know they're going to run you in behind, they're going to get one on one on the side, and then they're going to make the little darting runs in behind. So you've got, you know, Mane and Salah, they're going to cause you a lot of problems, and then obviously they've brought Jota in to do that. Firmino, when he's up top, for sure. But Chelsea just had a different dynamic with it. Yeah. Mm. So They're all different sort of players, yeah. Different yeah. players. So you've got the powerhouse, he occupies your two centre-halves. Werner and Havertz on a rapid, side. Rapid, skillful. Ra rapid, skillful. So they're going to hurt you in different ways. And if you're just dealing with a car when you've got a relatively high line, they're in behind you. So against Liverpool, you're not going to ne necessarily go as high anyway because of what they've got in terms of their pace in behind. But I think Chelsea had a, had a, a real variation in their attack. And set-piece point of view, so obviously goalkeeping like real goalkeeping coach head on corners free kicks who's out there that you think past and present you think we've got to watch him well always in 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 the early days of my coaching if you played Stoke you were up against it <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. you know? Stoke, by the way Stoke used to play with four centre backs under Tony Pulis by the way four centre backs yeah. so centre back at right back oh, centre yeah. back at oh, left back God. like Robert Hoof and yeah. some of them they changed the, middle. Middle. Like the fact that Danny Shawcross Hig wasn't it yeah Shawcross yeah. oh my but God Danny Higginbottom the way that they obviously Maybe. Over the years, then go, well, let's make our um, throw-ins like corners. Yeah. It's incredible. Well, it's well, that famous clip of Boaz, wasn't it? Boaz yeah. kicking the ball out for a uh, corner rather than a throw-in. Have you seen that clip, uh, yeah, by yeah, the way? Seen, How good seen, is that? But, but that's actually really good goalkeeping. Exactly. Really good. But I've actually, you see the Stoke stuff when Dilap used to throw it. I mean, it, it, oh, was it, it Dilap? Sorry. It, it, it was better than yeah. any corner that you could take. Yeah, it was yeah. like a missile coming in. Yeah, that's yeah. it. And they, you know, caused teams problems. But Pulis, set pieces, throw-ins, corners, free kicks. Stoke were yeah. the team not to face. But I think if you go into the job the job now I think the teams that are really tough are West Ham West Ham this year or the last couple of years under David Moyes they've obviously got the physicality they've got good delivery but they've got monsters you've got Rice Suchek Dawson what we always speak about with him He's <laughs> can we can we well I know you've just said Craig Dawson there can we just put another SOS call out for the boy Craig Dawson please uh, how much would we love to get Craig Dawson on this podcast Craig Tom? Dawson come on Craig Dawson come on, come on. this is like week three or four you, you of rung me now. last weekend and I asked you please come on and you were going well, yeah we'll do it sometime we're going to get you come on, on soon alright all right? make it's it happen we want Ballon Dawson on um, the podcast please give me your give me your um, impression of Craig Dawson when you're playing against I him. would love him to be a right 
now because I want to want to know he would put his grandmother in the back of the net. <laughs> <laughs> he just sees the ball. He's horrible. He's horrible isn't he? to mark. Yeah. <laughs> He's impossible to mark. Impossible. Because he? He, he what he does. But is, I want to know what makes him a killer. He he he. he, he he's. He's horrible, right? He is horrible. But what he does is he gets a run on you, yeah? So he, he will make sure he's holding back, but then he just runs. He picks a spot where he's going to run to, and he runs there. But it's like he knows where the ball's going to go. He can smell it, yeah? But when he's running there, just move out of his way because he'll take you down, and he'll head the ball, and he'll head you, and he'll hurt you. He don't care. And you're not in any. The lot's going in there. Nothing matters. Yeah, it's true. Um, Brilliant. I, can I give you a quick answer for that, for what the question you asked a minute ago about players where you come up against where you go, Ooh, okay, all worry. So obviously for me, as a goalkeeper, actually playing in the game, um, the, the, the team that worry me the most is always Man City. It's always Man City because I know that they quite literally work on getting the ball behind the fullback. They'll, they'll, get, they'll get overloads and they'll get the player behind the fullback and then they're just cutting it back across to the six yards, 10 yards, eight yards. They're cutting it into that space and most of the time there's two or three of them waiting there to just put it in the back of the net. So we will work on in training all week long on quite literally pullbacks cutbacks yeah so you'll be you'll have to come to the near post and then once they've cut it back you have to try and cut, get back into the goal bearing in mind you've got to cover a massive area you just have to hope for the best that it might be somewhere near you and you literally just work on that all week or long. just hope that they don't turn up that day no they will turn up that day they always turn up that day unfortunately they turn up but I always yeah. think against City exactly the sessions you're talking about yeah. sure cutbacks and when they're in behind you but you end up as a goalie working in real false positions yeah it's true because you're trying to protect your full back your two centre because because you know that they're going to get done yeah. and you actually you're playing in a, it's a different game against City it is yeah your positioning against City is different it's scary and that that is so it's not natural then so it's all it's fully scary isn't it it's fully scary and like I say you always just go to the lads lads just please try and try and hold on as long as we can if we can get to half time if we can get to half an hour 20 minutes yeah. just hold on just hold on and quite honestly the last 10 times I've played Man City about 3 minutes in goal and I'm thinking shit this is going to be 8 nil today it's that scary um, but there's the, the player I always used to worry about playing against Sergio Aguero because he was so he was the guy that didn't need much back lift so when he when he was running with the ball he he was so good at disguising when he was going to shoot it he would be running he could be running sideways across the 18 yard line he could be running directly at you and you'd he'd give no towels about, about when he's going to shoot his back lift would just be so quick and instantaneous and he could still kick it so fast and powerfully with swerve, with dip, all that kind of stuff that as a goalie, you don't have a chance to get set. And if you're not set, you are made to look a dickhead, aren't you? But that's the key to what we spoke about five, ten minutes ago when you talk about naturally positioning and things like that. But when you're playing a player like that, you always think you've got time just to make that fatal, normally, yeah. final last little step and he hits it just as you're having your last little step. Game over. It's done. It was in, it re, it's so interesting because when we had Jared Bowen on a few weeks ago and he was talking, I mean, I just sat there listening thinking, this is fascinating because he was talking about the goal that he scored against Fozzie. And it was almost like goalkeeper versus attacker. And he was saying, well, I'm waiting for you to, to kind of get your shot off. And he's going, well, I'm taking a look to see just when you move or something yeah. like that and it's this is these are all the little bits of goalkeeping now that are so important Dave aren't they yeah, Where, it's, it's, like, the it's, it's that nouse yeah it's yeah. that little cleverness yeah that you are watching his head a lot of the time you are you're not really watching his body so much you're watching his head because you're looking at for his eyes to see if he's looked at me or not and if he's looked at me where has he looked What's, what can he see is there a player in front of him that he needs to put it that side. It's all yeah. those tiny little things. And, and this is where when players just take it quick sometimes, you're still sort of watching and you're thinking, oh shit, he's just shot. <laughs> but, but, but that's the experience, isn't it? And, and obviously when you first start your, your goalkeeping sessions and a lot of your sessions, you've obviously got the tools now with mannequins and bits and pieces. But the best player will use that body in front of him. Yeah to make it really tough exactly, for you as a yeah, goalie. Yeah, yeah. And it's the positioning behind your fullback, centre half, whoever's in that covering position, and you making sure you're in the right position to make the save, that is key to it. Because it's all them things that the moving parts in front of you are just as critical for your decision making, because that 
has a big impact in your decision making what that last defender's doing for you yeah, do, yeah. You know, do you know what a lot of goals are getting scored nowadays and it's something that strikers work on now like you would not believe is shooting through legs yeah. so you know when it's a striker a gets out of his he takes that final touch before yeah. he's about to shoot it right yeah. he will purposely now aim for the legs yeah. of the defender in front of him or aim, a little no, it's literally yeah. that it's literally just touch bang and they're trying to go through that defender's legs yeah literally they are because they know the defender will nine times out of ten just do that little spread thing like that and they know their legs are coming open so he will purposely aim at his leg and if it goes through the legs as a goalie Dave it's aren't you you are screwed yeah but that's the point we're just talking to because if I'm in the goals and I've got a defender here and the striker's here I can position here because I'm trusting he's got this side of the exactly, goal exactly yeah but that moment he spreads his legs and the ball comes back through my positioning's probably just a little bit off now yeah and that reverse action oh you're it, done it, I would say nine, it, the, the saves at that point is an unbelievable. Is that why save. sometimes where the, the the ball might go in, someone's shot, and it might go in, and it's it's not in the bottom corner, even if it dribbles it. Yeah, but even this is but this is where in, yeah. maybe the pundits on TV will go. Mm, goalkeeper should be getting that, but then I guess the counter argument is the defender's not blocked it. No, no, no. Yeah, it, it's not. It's nobody's fault at that point. Honestly, you as a oh, goalie, yeah. you, uh, we were always taught as goalies just go after it. Yeah, just, just get yeah, after yeah, it and give it everything you got. Because at least then the commentator can't say, "Well, he hasn't even moved." The worst thing a commentator can say to you as a goalie is, "The goalie's not even moved." Yeah. So I had got my first, very first goalie coach, Ronnie Sinclair, would be like always just go after it no matter what even if you know you're not getting it 110% just go after it he said because then nobody can stand at the sidelines and say he hasn't even moved for that so that's what it would be but as, the second it goes through is that because we the goal you gotta remember the goal is so big for us goalies right that we have to sometimes use a defender and go right I just have to assume that he's going to do his job and get in the way of it right sometimes it'll go through his leg sometimes it'll just miss his leg whatever but if it does happen like that and it's on target you're struggling it's, it's a goal you're yeah? struggling you, but that's the positioning you have to trust that he can defend some element of the goal yeah. Yeah. it's massive when you stand in that goal and if yeah. you can get some help and hope that he's going to cover a yard, half a yard, it gives you a better chance. But the moment he gets done, uh, nine out of ten, you're probably done. Yeah, can we true. Can we talk about um, penalties and the psychology of penalties? Because a uh, question, I was, I was watching a clip the other day, and was it uh, VVD? Who was it recently where he, the goalkeeper stood on the left-hand side of the goal and the, the striker's gone there anyway? And he's absolutely rattled it in the top corner. Would it have been Kepper or something like yeah. that? Is it Kepper? The penalty shooter. Kepper yeah. and Kepper VVD like was, that, it? was it? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. And so, so like, if you're if you're VVD and you're going, I'm going that side, and the goalkeeper's stood over there, surely that's going to get in his. Well, it didn't get it's in all, his. It's head. all a psychology game. It is. It, like with penalties, whatever. Right. The, you expect the striker to score, don't you? You expect the, the penalty taker to score. Yeah, and I think the, the rules now have made it so difficult for yeah. you. Yeah, with the foot on the, the, with foot the, foot on on the line, line and, the, and the rules, because you, you can go full tilt and still it's a retake, you yeah. know what I mean? The, they've made it really difficult for the goalie to save it because if you wait, the power these lads can generate from a side foot pass yeah. and the accuracy, you're done. But the best ones who just wait that second while you've gone is... Can I, um, I've got a question, really good question here, Dave, okay? Can you build me your dream goalkeeper, yeah? Build me your dream goalkeeper, right? The first bit I'm going to ask for is footwork, yeah? I'm not talking about distribution here, I'm talking about footwork, like how they move around their goal, like gliding around their goal, quickness, efficiency, that kind of stuff. Who are we, take, who are we picking? My take on that at the minute would be De Gea. Really, yeah, the way he can move around. He's so quick across the goals yeah. to make the saves, it's effortless. Love that. And his positioning in the end of it is just perfect. I agree. Because it makes it look effortless. Yeah. It's, this is that cleverness of knowing where to be. Yeah. You, you could be out completely out of position, but it's like he knows that the ball will probably go there. He's done the math. He's done the yeah, calculations, yeah, sure. hasn't he? It's incredible. Yeah. All right, David Hay, I love that. That's for, that's for footwork and moving around the goal. We're talking about distribution now. Distribution now. Um, I think it's really important that you've got the ability to play off both feet. And the, the one who probably sticks out to me, head and shoulders, is range, his ability, calmness, is at Edison. Yeah. He's, te he's taking it to another platform. And just to put some context into that, 
when we, 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 we obviously at Southampton last season played them twice, um, obviously we're a, we were a high pressing team. So we actually go after him and them a little bit. Idiots. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the danger, because he's got such a range, is the long ball Over the in top. behind you. Yeah. I, I've never seen anything like it. It's two steps and it's effortless to kick the length of the yeah. field. So there is nothing that guy can't do. Yeah, I agree with that. Nothing. I, I totally, that's the that's the scary bit about Man City because they've got they've got literally everything closed off. He they put, can do he everything. Puts them in on a goal kick. But that's what I'm saying. So you can't push up against Man City. You can't because he can put it over you, and they're looking for it to be put over so yeah. they can just run onto it. Sergio Aguero used to stand it, sort of like honestly watch some watch some games back in the day. Sergio terrible. Aguero would stand probably forty yards from my goal and he would just stand there you can't be offside from a goal kick offside. right so we have to drop because we know he can just yeah, put the yeah. ball there but, so, but, but so we in, have to drop but now you're in real problems because when you give them two thirds of a field to exactly build up, you're in, yeah. you're, you're, what you did you're in, so that's why they do it problems. they want us to drop but because we have to drop it's, so then they've got space to play out and then just they'll do you that way but it's not like it's these long looping kicks oh, no, it's, drilled. it's a missile, missile it's a pass it? yeah. I, I, I couldn't you, you'll be able to find the stats for the rest of the podcast there must be four or five assists where it's on his foot and he's in and scored. It's incredible. <laughs> right, um, let's talk about handling, yeah? Like, nice, clean, calm hands. Somebody in the Premier League, at th- th- this moment in time, who's got just lovely, calm, clean hands, catches everything, doesn't make a fuss of it. Uh, to be fair, Al McCarthy at um, really, Southampton yeah. is a real natural, calm catcher of a football um, and it's nice to see that he came back at the end of the season and did really well, didn't he? Yeah. Come really well when he obviously had a few injury problems. Yeah. But he's a he's a natural catcher of the ball, yeah. and that's something that is there. You obviously as part of the drills, you'd be firing balls, firing balls, firing balls. But he's a natural catcher of the ball. Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of catching the ball is is that calmness under pressure, isn't it? But I think that's more of an English thing for us. Really? I think a lot of the foreign goalies don't do as much catching yeah. as what we would do in our sessions yeah. and they're happy to bat away but they don't give little tappings away the ball's out of the danger they're zone. really getting rid of it and yeah. we know the, probably the best one we work with with that was Big Fraser yeah. he would never want to go really soft he'd be a big parry yeah. and it's out of the danger zone and we defend the second phase yeah that's good I think yeah I totally agree with that actually Big Fraser is that guy like, but you, like I said you're not getting a tap in from it it's going out for a throw in over there yeah, I think like, we right over there. corner at the other end hey, I've seen him put them on a counter attack <laughs> before long, mate, but I've I... seen him put a, um, Southampton on a counter attack because he has batted it away <laughs> that hard right they've gone on counter attack I'm thinking Jesus but, Christ but Fraser. I think we've learned some of that from the foreigners because yeah. we were always I were brought up it was all catch, 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 catch. Yeah, yeah, training, yeah. catch, 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 catch. And you went soft that give chances for tappings. If you go hard, balls out the day. Yeah, it's out yeah. There. Okay, so um, we've just talked about hands. Let's talk about agility, ability to quickly get themselves into a position to make that top corner save. I would say in the league at the minute, it's probably a little bit unique in Nari Keeps goal, a bit yeah. like Shea given in his time, Larice. Yeah. His agility. He's quick, but his agility to make big saves. Nimble, quick Nimble, saves. Nimble, big saves. Yeah. yeah. It's, really quick. I, I totally agree. He's, um, he's like, he, he can just see it and he's able to get the footwork in quick enough to he's get himself always, pushed off. He's the one goalie because of, he's more my stature, round about six foot rather than you at six feet, six feet four. Yeah. We needed to get an extra contact. Were you bigger lads? If you've got the power, you can yeah, just you push can on one. But I think the smaller ones have to get that extra step and really use that. Yeah, agility. use their feet more and, to cover more ground cover so more then ground. they can dive. And they've got the momentum into a big save then. Yeah, I love but that. You guys just used to make a big save. Mm. Lazy compared to me, lazy. <laughs> just jealous. That's it just, does, that's just je- jealousy. jealousy. It does look yeah, spectacular jealousy. though. You're right though. Like when you look at six foot uh, and less goalkeepers, they, they, they often you see the, the, exactly that momentum and that kind of running into it, and the, the spring, and it yeah. often looks spectacular, it, doesn't it's it? It's a presence, but like I would be really a, a little bit in awe when I would be in the, in the tunnel now if I were a goalie because everybody's a monster. They are, aren't they? You know, the profiling really for a goalie to play Premier League football. You, you're not got much chance unless you're six foot three, six foot four. Yeah, you've true. got to have some really outstanding attributes. No, re- I mean got really. Out, you've got to have the X factor in six or seven of the main things. If you're not six foot three or six foot four, you've got to tick them. You, you, you've got to be star performing at all these attributes we're talking right, about yeah, to true. survive at that level. 
Yeah, wow. it's true. Um, yeah. Right, let's talk about let's talk about cross taking um, balls into the box, corners, free kicks. Because the, there's a million different things with cross taking, isn't it? Break it down for me for what you want from that guy. The first bit always is the mentality that I'm coming. Yeah, and some clear communication and your defenders knowing it's so you. taking a positive taking a positive position, start position because yeah. it affects the mindset of the taker. Yeah, if you if you're insular and come inside. It gives him so much space to put it behind your back three, back four, back five, whatever you're playing. And when there's that corridor of uncertainty, I think it gets to the, your defenders' heads as well. Yeah, I think when if you're know one of these goalies coming. who's kind of known for not coming for stuff, it makes your back line just drop. They just automatically drop. And then before the free kick's even taken, when he's running up, they're already dropping. And it, it and, then, and then when oh. when you're coming this way, they're coming that disaster, carnage. Yeah, but you've got to know that. But the one guy. He doesn't play in the Premier League now, but who changed the whole way of my thinking as a coach were Courtois when he played at Chelsea. Ah, yeah. I have never seen anybody as aggressive. Well, I would have to probably go back to David James for somebody who were really as aggressive in his start positions. Aggressive, wanted to dominate and did dominate. Really came for them balls. Yeah. If I were changing that uh, scenario uh, now, I think Nick Pope obviously has just had a move to Newcastle, which will do him the world of good having been at Burnley and obviously the, the, the different uh, requirements at Burnley compared to Newcastle now, but he were aggressive yeah. and came for his balls and did his fair share, more than his fair he share. Did to take that he pressure did do, didn't team. he? I, was, to, I would have said, I'd have said Nick Pope. I think Nick Pope is, he's definitely the best I've seen. Uh, he's the best English goalie. Yeah, best English goalie I've seen. Uh, taking the starting position off where I'm watching him thinking Jesus mate that is outrageously aggressive but because he is so big there were a lot of times he didn't even have to jump you know he would just stand there put his arms in the air and he would just take it but I'm thinking that's, that's such a brave thing to do as well because mm. you know if you take that position and you cock up yeah. like you don't get there or you drop it or you miss it it's a goal you know you guys you're too know, far out you your goal you guys will know that you guys will know that but a lot of kind of people that aren't in the game like myself um, will will almost have a pop at goalkeepers because they don't know for coming out and they might fumble the odd one or something like that. Whereas I think if you're a general football fan and maybe you're not in the game, they'll see players, goalkeepers that will stay on their line and think, well, no mistake's been made there, but that mistake's already oh, been no, made, hasn't it? There's, you, you as a goalie coach and me as a goalkeeper, as somebody who's played, right? You, you can tell every single ball that goes into the box whether the goalie should have come yeah, or not. Sure. Yeah. You well, know, don't you? It's about that start position. So I'd go back to the Pope thing. Really aggressive this year on long throws. He'd be standing there yeah, to receive it. Yeah, he does. Now, you don't see too many goalies do that. I but the one thing I would like, not to necessarily do with him, but the one thing you talk about when you talk about because he's aggressive, he can just stand there and take it. But again, because of the profile in six foot three, six feet four, what you want to get into them goalies is the brave start position, the mentality I'm coming, defenders knowing, but then if you can get that real trigger, late and fast, aggressive into the ball, yeah. and try and get three, four, five, six inches on a spring, you're invincible. Yeah. What players are there though? What players are there, outfield players, that will make you as coaches, you as goalkeepers, they're that good at ball, at ball delivery where you'll make the question, and maybe Nick Pope will go, Ooh. You know where they put it in that area where you go, James Ward Prowse. James Ward Prowse. <laughs> <laughs> Prowse yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about James Ward Prowse. Yeah, free kick are incredible. We, you know, he wouldn't practice probably as often as, as you would think in terms of the, the actual free kicks. Yeah. We did a lot of work, corners, wide free kicks, things like that. But he would always finish, certainly Thursday, Friday would always be half a dozen a, a day. And we'd put the wall in the two different positions and really operate. But I mean, postage stamp kind of ability yeah, like, as, about but, as he can as put it, but he can put it both sides yeah but if you're talking about the open play in, in the game stuff like a De Bruyne could do you near post <sighs> wow. from, from nowhere oh. I, I mean is it the post against the cup uh, Mesley I think he yeah, did last yeah. year because Mesley I wouldn't he, he's normally pretty aggressive in his start yeah. but you play City you always become insular but then that gives them the ball behind the back, back line and you're in between them two positions again. Uh, again, it's who you're playing against. Is there the any level. that you play against, Fozzie, that you that make you question it or second Ke guess Ke it? Kevin De Bruyne. I was just yeah. about. I was literally about to jump on that and say that that Kevin De Bruyne boggles your head so much, right? Because he is so powerful. He's he's got the side foot like wrap, inside foot wrap, yeah. Where you think he might be crossing it, so you try and take an advanced starting position to help your, your back line out, help your defenders out. 
and he's already putting it in the bottom corner over there. And you're thinking, oh my God, how can you kick a ball so fast and so hard? You go back to the same thing you talked about at City. You want to be doing your work, coming across the goal for the cutbacks and that. Yeah. And the one thing I said to younger goalies is, you've got to do your job first. Yes, you want to help them. You know it's a tough day today. Yeah. But when you start doing overcomplicating your job, you're going to be caught in between. Your defenders are, and it's disaster. Yeah. Start with the platform first, and then when you get a bit more experience, you can chance it a little bit, but you don't want to chance it against somebody of his quality. No, God, no. Um, I, we need to do We need to do the mentality. The mentality monster. Who, which goalkeeper is the, the most... Oh, he's just got it about him. He don't care. He steps... <laughs> oh. No, do you know what I mean, though? How good is it when you see a goalie who just gets out there, he does not care about the... the the possible chance he might make a mistake, nothing. He just he just deal with it. Um, in the Premier League at the minute, the the, the mentality monster, the the, the English one I'm going to say were Ramsdale. Yeah, nice. So Ramsdale at Arsenal, having gone to a big money move as an English goalkeeper who's had a couple of relegations. That's not his fault, but you've been in them tricky situations. Relegations are never the goalie's fault, Dave. All right, don't pin it on a goalie. No, no but you get, I'm, I'm you, the joint most relegated you, goalkeeper in Premier get, League history. You, all right, <laughs> you get drawn into this, but I think if you turn that on its head, yeah. for two relegations and then a club like Arsenal to have really backed English goalies, which we want to be backing ourselves. Uh, and for him to have come into that, he seems, I've not worked with him, but he seems to have got the mentality that he's unfazed yeah. by what happens in front of him. Yeah. And I think for him to be that is a real, you have to have it. It's incredible, isn't it? But you, I think he's got that there. Yeah, I it totally seems agree. To, seems to be I totally agree. for me. We had, we had him on the Donna podcast. Rumma, when you, sorry, Ben, yeah, you mentioned Donnarumma uh, at the age he's at. Aaron Ramsdale's had adversity yeah for sure he? yeah for sure and he's still and he's still come back and he's on. just absolutely smashed it but you see the way he plays like he's he, he's got a new weird style of playing he has the way arsenal play he's always on the edge of his box where he's high isn't he's it? high it's so high he plays honestly it's so it's mad to see and he's like he shepherds them out as well he's getting the ball played play back to him and he's going move go 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 because he wants to get them going quickly it's really good to watch and i could totally agree with you give me another one premier league Premier League, the other monster, I would say, who never seems to be faced to me, played in the Premier League a long, long time now. Probably underrated, really. Had it tough because his father played in goal, I would have said Casper Smile. Oh, very good shout. Really, really good shout. Totally agree, mate. Mentality totally. is incredible. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Just, you know what you're going to get. You know what you're going to get. We had him on the podcast out. and even like before we started rolling, uh, talking to him after... You can tell he's you got a, just tell. a different yeah. type of mentality. You can tell. You, you talked earlier on about being wired up a little bit differently. You can you can tell with him, can't yeah, you? Yeah, you can, you can. Yeah. Um, talk to me about... You're smashing this, by the way. This is incredible. I'm buzzing. I could I could do this for about another two hours or so. We've done four hours. Mate, we, oh, might yeah, to, we, might minutes, another, we might have to do another part two or something, all right? Yeah. Um, talk to me about uh, the debrief after a football match. So say you just, you just played somebody on a Saturday afternoon... Do you do a do debrief? When do you do a debrief? How how deep into it do you go? I would be always very deep. I think what, what I touched on earlier in, in the interview, I think for the goalie to be the best he can be and for me to keep improving as a coach, you have to have a, an honest and open relationship. What happens when I would debrief in either my office or a, the black box we had at Southampton would remain private. There's conversations I'd have with other coaches or the manager, but we have to really go in depth into an honest conversation. If I feel as though there's something that you could have done better. Yeah. I never used to do it the day after a game. I always thought it were too, too close, too close. Just give it a little time to breathe. Give it a little time, give it a breather. You could have your thoughts. I'd have my thoughts. The way I used to work in the end, I used to debrief a run of four or five games. Then I'd ask you to debrief me on ah, your okay. performance. Just to get a different psyche. Yeah. Because you'd have been hearing me say X, Y, or Z for five or six games. Right, now you take the game. I'm still going to debrief it how I would debrief it, but I want to see if you're seeing the game the same as me. I like it, yeah, I like Just it. Just for a different stimulus. And what, what and are challenge. the goal, do the goal, goalkeepers normally buy into this? Are they, are they looking forward to this? Is it something they yeah, dread or it, what? It, I, I, yeah, of course, at first. It, if they've made a mistake, they dread it. <laughs> no, but I think the mistake's easy to cover yeah, because yeah. it's a black and white mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's actually seeing the game that we understand the game in the same thing for what we spoke about, the subtlety of a start position. 
uh, uh, seeing a, a certain pass, a certain start it's position for a through it's ball. It's not even a subtlety though. You know it as well. This but that's, is where I need to be honest, isn't I it? I want them to be honest with me. Yeah. A mistake's easy for yeah, me yeah, to yeah. say, you to say to me. It's n reading the game, how I believe the cut for, for my goalkeeping philosophy should be played that we're on the same page. Yeah. So the debrief to me were more about things like that. Yeah. When they delivered to me. Um, what about I, the other way? Sorry, what about the other way where do you actively kind of seek out not feedback from goalkeepers, but say, what what else do you need from me? Because obviously your primary primary focus is I'm guessing the, the number one. Yeah, for but sure. then the number two and the number three is going to be very different. So do you kind of have you ever got into a position where you've been at a club where you're doing things a certain way and either you've realised or the goalkeeper said this isn't working for me and you've had to adapt? Not really, but you've, I've, al I've always had the, the, the open door scenario where there can be an, a, an open line of communication and you are predominantly servicing that number one. But when the number one's gone off to do X, Y or Z, that's then when you're fine tuning your second goalie for whatever, for he might be getting some time in a cup game or you normally would have a really experienced third choice or you've got a young lad you really need to work with. Or in some cases, you'd have the third choice who's experienced and you've got a fourth kid who's coming through and you need time to go away and work and develop these kind of things. So it's it's always, it depends on your philosophy of your club and, and how you've structured the department, really, okay. and how you would normally work it. But normally the number one, the rest have to conform. Because if I'm doing a session like we touched on, just say it's Man City, so you're doing cutbacks, that's really irrelevant to the fourth choice who's a young guy coming through who maybe never faced them scenarios. Yeah, yeah. The older experienced goalie would have possibly never done it the way you're talking about doing it at this point. You're driving for the game and the prep for the number one to be ready. But when he's gone off to do X, Y, or Z, that's when you fine tune the rest of it. Yeah, a bit of time to work with them. To work with them on their specific deficiencies that I've deemed appropriate for that day or that week or maybe even the se season long, long term goal for them. But the number one you drive in the training is always about the game that's coming next and everybody conforms to that because they can all take something from it. But when, when the number one and number two have normally gone off into certain elements, that's when you would come back them. to and What about the GK, young GKs that are out on loan? Is that something that you keep an eye on or do you have somebody in your department that, that deals with You with would that? normally obviously keep an eye on it on your own. The old days of going to games like I used to do two or three nights a week and on a Sunday or whenever you're not playing, those days are gone because you get all the things on the videos and, the, and, and you get Y Scout and all this kind of thing to see it all on now. But I think... Uh, we spoke about Jack Butland earlier. You talk about the, the pathway for a goalie to make mistakes. You have to make mistakes live and playing yeah. and learning and learning. And why he became the profile he got to very quickly is because at Birmingham, we managed to get him out on loan at Cheltenham. Um, so he had a year's experience at that football league level. He could train with us still two days a week. So he got the blend of everything mm. because it's not nice. And that's why it's difficult now for a young manager to give a young goalie a chance because managers don't get too much time. But a young goalie needs time to flourish and yeah. he's going to make lots of mistakes. And obviously, yeah. if your job's on the line, it's difficult for you to... It's tough. Give young goalies need experience, but young managers, managers the, don't want the managers uh, a, an inexperienced goalkeeper. What you said about the philosophy of the club. And I'm, I'm guessing that's intimating as to, yeah, if you've got a club that's, you know, fast turnover, if you've got a consistent club where it's it's stable and there's, there's longevity. not many of them though, is there? No, there's, there isn't, there's not. honestly, there's, there's not, not many of them. It's time's the one commodity none of us have. Exactly. exactly. Um, can you try and just dispel the, the, the common myth that all goalkeepers are mad? Give me your give me your take on the goalkeepers compared to outfield players. I think we we have a different uh, mentality for sure, and the the application we have for training is a is a different application. We touched on it at the very start of it. You have to have that mentality that the ball's not going to go past you, and you're prepared to do anything to stop that happening. But that's how we are ingrained for the training and that mentality to take into a match day. But I actually think the rest of it now we're an integral part of a group as a team yeah. that is very important. And the days are really long gone when you would stand in the corner with a goalie coach and you'd be out there for a couple of hours just doing your own thing. It is a specific role and it needs a specific kind of guy to play in goal. And you need to have 
the best goalkeeping coaches you can if you're really going to push on. But we are now really seen as an integral part of the team. And me moving forward as as an assistant coach and wherever it takes me, assistant manager or even maybe manager at some point if I were that fortunate. Would you like I, to be a manager, honestly? Not really, I don't What's think. wrong with you? Yes, but I would that really base my team around the goalie. Would you? That's yeah. how integral yeah, it is okay. to the job. Yeah. Whether you're trying to win it, trying to stay in the league or trying to keep me what, as a what coach. What sort of goalie would you have in your team? If you're, if you're manager of a football team, what sort of goalie are you having? I want the fucking goalie we've just produced. Yeah, you want that Frankenstein I want goalie. him. The Franken goalie. And then I'm not going to be Franken a manager. goalie. I'm going to be an agent and that's me finished. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a question for you then. So, so when we were talking earlier on about coaching badges and yeah. you would do your outfield and your goalkeepers, would a real, like, I imagine, and I'm guessing here, someone like Steven Gerrard, for example, or um, would the outfield players flip it and do the goalkeeping badges to understand the team, the position? They, Is that something that happens? They, they, they wouldn't, I mean, I can't put words in the mouth, they don't do the goalkeeping badge. But when you do an outfield badge... There is a goalkeeping element for a day or a couple oh, of days okay, yeah, where yeah. they get delivered about goalkeeping. So they would have that as a module on part of the course. Have you ever known an outfield player do it, a goalkeeping course? No. Yeah, just to build up a better no. pitch? No, they no. wouldn't. No. They genuinely wouldn't. So it's just like when you go on the courses, you would have a corner for psychology, you would have a corner for fitness, you would have a corner for coach. There will be an element... Yeah, of goalkeeping yeah, yeah, yeah. on the outfield. But that's when you have your. All right. Well, you're killing it, mate. Last couple of questions. We're golden, mate. We're absolutely golden. Best performance you saw live last season. Which goalkeeper did you play against where you went, whoa, you are on fire today? The best goalkeeping performance last year in a game that sticks out to me were probably Pope when we played Burnley away. Ah, really? In a game they had to win. Yeah. We were dominant in the game for large periods, end up getting well beaten, but he made three or four like, Proper. incredible saves. And doing all his usual coming for crosses and yeah, just making spoiling life all your tough. fun. Yeah, yeah, spoiling all my fun. It yeah. does. It takes the wind out of your sails so much when a goalie's on but fire he made a and then of, it comes a and takes big saves. saves. And at key moments in the game, it changed the game. Yeah. And uh, we went on to get better. Who's the um, best goalkeeper in the world at this moment in time? The one, uh, whether he's the best, I don't know. But for, for me, having worked in the game so long, one I would like to work with is the guy we spoke about, Donnarumma. Yeah, I, th I think he could. I think he could. I think he's got more to come when I see him. Yeah, and and that excites me. If you like, from a coaching perspective, I don't know. Would I be right in saying he's the best in the world at the minute? Pro pro probably not. But I think he could get there. Yeah, I like that, um, mate. That was absolutely top class. Brilliant. Thank you Dave very much. Dave Watson, what a guy. I knew this was going to be good. I, as very always, good. the goalie pods I look forward to anyway because it's a full geek fest. You break it down, you really get into the detail. But I think you've described it absolutely perfectly today. What a what an absolute Thank you very much. friggin' legend. Cheers, um, guys. Loved it. We're, we're, right, so all we need to do is literally look into that. You're looking into, yeah, look into that fire camera. I'll go first, then Tom, then you. And we go... Up the Foscast. Up the Foscast. Up the Foscast. Yes. There we What's go. We've got, we've got a northerner. Up the Foscast. Up to the Foscast. Thanks everybody for watching. We hope you enjoyed the latest episode of the Foscast. Don't forget to give us a follow on Spotify. Up the Foscasts.